Alright, yeah, and welcome back to some more Magic Jewels. This week, I'm going to be taking a look at a Simic deck brought to you by our wonderful patrons. So, thank you very much for your support, guys. Really helps out a lot. So, this is going to be a Simic good stuff kind of ramp deck. Uh, it's going to play all of the best cards in Simic for the most part, anyway. Um, the most kind of thing is it's got a lot of uh, ones, twos, threes, fours, and fives in terms of drops. So, we should be able to hit a card every single turn and every card that we hit is usually some really good value card that allows everything else to synergize a little bit better so we got planeswalkers we got ramp we got big creatures and we got big enchantments because why would you not play at least one copy of sandworm convergence all right let's start at the very beginning of the deck shall we we've got our turn one play oath of nissa um oath of nissa for the most part is usually played in super friends decks but in this particular case i'm just using it to um look at the top three cards of our library it's a nice turn one play and it does somewhat help with casting your planeswalkers as well because the the double blue can be annoying and we can also just use all of our green to cast jace at that point if we've got something better to play as well so it doesn't lock us out of specific colors if we do end up playing our planeswalkers but for the most part we want to use it for the top ability anyway. Look at the top three cards of your library. You may reveal a creature, land, or planeswalker. Put that card from among them into your hand. The rest is on the bottom of your library. So we've got a lot of creatures, lands, and planeswalkers. So this likely always hits something good for us. Uh, Sylvan Advocate is the next card. So for one and a green, we get a 2-3 with Vigilance. As long as you control six or more lands, Sylvan Advocate and land creatures you control get plus two, plus two. As far as land creatures are concerned, Nissa, her ultimate generates land creatures. Um, I don't believe there are many other things other than our um, Lumbering Falls as well. So they'd be 5-5 five, five hexproof creatures, which is pretty solid. But for the most part, that's generally all that's going to get that plus 2, plus 2. But it could be relevant later down the line. But a 4-5 for 2 with Vigilance is also pretty solid. And a great 2-drop to start it off with. It slows down aggro so much, having that 2-3 body. Next, we've got Elvish Visionary, just to help us draw through our deck. Make sure that we get that extra consistency, because this is a value deck. So we want to be essentially hitting um, the top of our current curve as far as mana cost is concerned every single turn. So Elvish Visionary allows us to draw maybe our 3 drops for the next turn, or something along those lines. So 1-1 one, one to draw a card. It's not too bad, not too good either, but, you know, decent value. Anyway, after that we've got Nissa, Steward of Elements. This is essentially our turn 3 play, but it also depends on what turn we draw it on. So, Nissa enters with X Loyalty, based on how much we cast her. So, the later it goes on in the game, the more powerful she can become. If we get an X her for 10, then we can use this 0 ability to essentially play Ulamog onto the battlefield, if we can set it up that way. The way that we set it up is mostly by the plus 2 ability on Nissa here, so plus two, scry two. So we can set up the top card for the next turn by essentially scrying both to the top, but making sure the one below uh, the top card is the one that we want to zero. So really nice synergy in Nissa alone. She can synergize with herself. We can also ultimate as well, minus six, untap two target lands you control. They become five, five elemental creatures with flying and haste, but they're still lands. Um, it's only till the end, until the end of the turn. Remember we can make those 7-7s seven with Sylvan Advocates as well, so we could swing in for as much as 14 in the air with Nyssa. Excuse me. Um, after that we've got Tyler's Tracker. More card advantage. This deck does a lot of drawing for a green deck, which is really nice. So for 2 and a green we get a 3-2. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you get to investigate, and what investigate means it is essentially landfall, we create a clue, and it has the ability to pay two, sacrifice it, and draw a card. Whenever you sacrifice a clue, you get to put a 1-1 one -one counter on Tireless Tracker. So this is early game card advantage, late game big hitter. We've got a lot of ways to play multiple lands in a turn, so Tireless Tracker is pretty solid. After that, we've got one copy of Reclamation Sage. It's in here to take care of things like um, field visions and um, Sphinx's Tutelage, things like that. Two and a green for a 2-1. When it enters the battlefield, destroy target artifact or enchantment. Destroying artifacts can take care of gear hulks as well, so this can be a big creature remover as well in the right circumstance. So 
We're running one copy mostly because it can be tutored up with our Green Warden if it dies, but also be pulled out of our deck and properly tutored with the Woodland Bellower. So we effectively have two copies of Reclamation Sage. Oh god. Next we've got two copies of Weaver of Currents. So for one, a green and a blue, we get a 2-2. Two, 2-2 two. Two, two for three, not great, but it does allow us to tap down to add two colourless mana. So it essentially allows us to ramp into our six drops on turn four. So that's pretty good. Um, so our six drops are essentially the big hitters. I mean, we get all of our planeswalkers. We get Green Warden, Woodland Bellower, Uvenwald Hydra, and big bounces and stuff like that. So going into our six drops early is pretty good. We're only running two copies though, because we do have a fair bit of ramp, so these become less uh, important as the game goes on. Next we've got three copies of Rogue Refiner. Rogue Refiner is a one, a green and a blue for a 3-2. When it enters the battlefield you draw a card and get two energy. So it's essentially a three mana version of Elvish Visionary, except for it's got a bigger body for one extra mana. And generates energy as well, which allows us essentially to use Ethobes for mana fixing. But yeah, Ether Hubs have like a one-time use for coloured mana, but with our Rogue Refiner we get to get two more uses out of them, so in the early game that might matter, late game not so much. But it's just a nice way to make sure that we've got essentially some more um, dual lands in our deck, which pretty much means that we never struggle for a specific colour of mana. Next we've got one copy of Imprisoned in the Moon. This is kind of our removal uh, for planeswalkers, enchantments, all sorts. Uh, not enchantments, sorry, lands, planeswalkers, and creatures. So, Ulamogs, uh, any nasty planeswalker. Um, but yeah, it's a solid card. We're only running one though, because I don't think we really need more than one, to be honest. Next, we've got two copies of Pulsar Morassa. Pulsar Morassa is a two and a green instant. Return target creature or land from a graveyard. To its owner's hand you gain six life the six life's really good against aggro builds and stuff like that for three mana on turn three sorry as soon as turn three we get six life which can undo the past two turns depending on how quickly our opponent's been getting threats out can also allow us to pull lands if we've maybe lost one which is not unlikely to happen mostly it's here to pull creatures back because we do have 19 creatures to choose from and most of them are big hitters there's also a nice synergy with Green Warden and Marassa as well. Uh, Green Warden, when you play it, you can return the pulse, and then if Green Warden dies, you can pulse it back, and when it comes back to the battlefield, you pull the pulse back. So you gain six life whenever Green Warden dies, essentially. Apologies for the muting. Um, uh, I've got a really horrible cough, so I'm just trying to power through it. In fact, you know what? There's a Strepsils right here. We've got two copies of Altered Ego as well, uh, 4 mana and X for a 0, zero that can't be countered, really solid stuff. Um, it enters the battlefield as a copy of any creature on the battlefield, except for it comes with X additional 1-1 one -one counters on it. So whatever our opponent plays, whatever we play, with Altered Ego we can top it, and for 1 mana extra on top of that 4, we can just make it a lot better. So if our opponent Ulamogs we can 5 mana Ulamog them back. We don't get the cast trigger, but we can get any end of the battlefield abilities that the creature might have had, which is really solid. <clears throat> Next we've got two copies of Bounty of the Luxor. Really want to play with this card a lot, and I think any Simic build that you make usually should have Bounty of the Luxor in it. 4 mana at the beginning of the pre-combat main phase. If it's the first time you've played it, you draw a card, otherwise you add 3 mana to your mana pool. So that can put us up to, I think it's 8 mana on turn 5? Yeah, 8 mana on turn 5 and then you can play land and go crazy with it. It's really good at ramping, but also the card advantage is pretty insane. This deck is really good for card advantage. You're never going to have a, uh, a shortage of things to do. And we need mana to do that, so Explosive Vegetation. 3 copies, uh, 3 and a green for a sorcery speed. Search your library for up to 2 basic land cards and put them onto the battlefield tapped and shuffle your library. So, four mana into six mana for the next turn. <coughs> oh, sorry. I am not well. Mm. But yeah, um, ramping into 
a lot of our really heavy hitting cards for the following turn is really good. So this is usually our turn 4 play if we don't have a bounty or a Kiora or something like that. Next we've got Kiora. Kiora is actually a really good synergy in this deck. I didn't think she would be, I just put her in here as a Simic Planeswalker that I don't play very often. With a little bit of upside, but... <clears throat> she's good ramping. You can untap a creature and a land. That creature could be a Weaver of Currents as well, so we could untap up to 3 mana <clears throat> with Kiora. Also a creature lands as well. Uh, you can use those to untap for 2 mana. But she effectively gives a creature Vigilance and gives you extra mana for a plus 1. A minus 2 is also very useful as well. Reveal the top 4 cards of your library. You may put a creature card or land card from among them into your hand, the rest onto the graveyard. So if we did drop lands in there as well, Pulse of Marasa could allow us to get them back if we need our 5th mana, for example. Something like that. Uh, our ultimate is pretty solid as well. You get an emblem with it. Whenever a creature enters battlefield under your control, you may have it fight target creature. Then you put 388 blue octopus creature tokens onto the battlefield. This uh, 388 is a one-time deal. Um, you don't put them onto the battlefield after you've um, fought a creature or whenever you do that anyway. <clears throat> but all of our creatures are really well set up for fighting. You've got 6 power there, 5 power there, infinite power there. <laughs> um, even our low drops as well are three twos, four fives, and stuff like that. So there's no shortage of uh, the taking advantage of that emblem. And those three eight eights that enter the battlefield as well, <clears throat> after you create the emblem, they also fight with creatures. So this is remove three creatures from the battlefield, essentially, uh, as soon as you get the emblem. Next, we've got Jace, Unraveler of Secrets. Three and two blue. For a five loyalty players walker, plus one. Scry one, then draw a card. So, really good card advantage. Allows us to find what we need as well. The minus two allows us to bounce creatures as well. Can be really good at protecting Jace if we need to. Uh, can also just slow our opponent down, which allows us time to ramp out and get our big solid creatures out there. The ultimate is really useful. Since we don't run uh, counter spells or much removal, we can uh, use the ultimate in order to counter the first spell that our opponent casts each turn, each turn which is awesome. Um, this does count on our turn as well, so if they're running counter magic and we play a creature, their first counter spell on our turn is going to get countered as well. So it's pretty good. We then have Nissa Vital Force, 3 and 2 green for a 5 loyalty planeswalker. Plus one, untap target land you control. Until your next turn, it becomes a 5-5 elemental creature with haste, still a land. 7-7 seven, seven with our Sylvan Advocates as well, remember, and this elemental creature can be something for Kiora to untap as well. So it allows us to get that extra mana out there. The minus three is essentially Green Warden and Morass's ability. Uh, return target permanent from permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. Synergizes with Kiora a fair bit as well. Because she'll mill some stuff. If there's extra stuff in the graveyard that we wanted to grab off Kiora but didn't quite have the options, then Nissa can grab it back for us as well. Really good. Uh, the minus six, whenever you get an emblem with there, whenever you play a land enters the battlefield under your control, you may draw a card. Not really a fan of this one in this deck, mostly because of the amount, the sheer amount of draw that we've got, but it can be useful. And it is a May ability as well, so you can't mill yourself out on it. Mostly though, uh, she's here for the big hitting 5 and the minus 3, so we can pull back whatever we need. Next, Green Warden Morasso. Briefly touched upon this guy. When he enters the battlefield, you get to pull a card from your graveyard and put it into your hand. And when he dies, you get to do exactly the same, except for you can exile him out of your graveyard. I wouldn't advise doing this second ability just because of Pulse of Morasso being in the deck. Because Pulse can always bring Green Warden back, and then Green Warden can bring back whatever he wants at that point, so... Having him in the graveyard um, is usually the best idea. But if you need something at a really crucial time, then uh, exiling him is perfectly acceptable. We then have a copy of Woodland Bellower. Woodland Bellower enters the battlefield. He gets to search your library for a non-legendary green creature card with converted mana cost 3 or less. And you put it onto the battlefield and shuffle your library. Where creatures that this can target include... Rogue Refiner, Weaver of Currents for Ramp, Reclamation Sage for Artifacts or Enchantment Removal, 
Tireless Tracker for card advantage, Elvish Visionary for card draw immediately, Sylvan Advocate for a big body. Those are pretty much the things that it hits. We can also copy it as well with Altered Ego, because Woodland Bellower is not legendary, so if we want to copy it, we absolutely can. Uh, I think this is... no, this is not the final creature. we still got Uvenwald Hydra. Uh, 4 and 2 green for an XX with Reach. Its power and toughness are equal to the number of lands you control. <coughs> Oh, sorry about that. Um, Uvenwald Hydra, it's a battlefield. You may search your library for a land card, put it onto the battlefield, tap, and shuffle your library. So he's always a 7-7 seven, seven, as he enters for 6 with reach. So if your opponent's got a lot of flyers, you've now got a big blocker. The land you want to grab almost every time is Rogue's Passage. Rogue's Passage is a colourless land. You can pay 4 to make target creature uh, unblockable for the turn. So essentially making an Overmold Hydra a 7-7 seven, seven unblockable creature every single time is solid. Um, if you've already got Rogue's Passage then you probably just want to grab a, either a Dual Land or um, an Eper Hub, something like that. Next we've got Crush of Tentacles. If all is going horribly wrong, we have a reset button. So for 4 and 2 blue, return all non-land permanents to their owner's hand. If Crush of Tentacles surge cost was paid, you get to put an 8-8 eight, eight blue octopus creature token onto the battlefield instead. Surge is essentially, if you cast it as your second spell for the turn, then you get to cast it for that amount of mana instead. Uh, so it costs 5 instead of 6. So you can get a little bit of cost reduction on it, but you're not going to cheat mana essentially with it. Next we've got Sandworm Convergence, 6 and 2 green enchantment. We, deal, uh, we have a little bit of problems with flyers, so... Sandworm Convergence, creatures with flying can't attack you or planeswalkers you control. The beginning of your end step, create a 5 5 green worm creature token. Only got one copy of this. Uh, I used to have planar bridge in here, so there's a reason why there's a lot of one copies because I could just pull whatever I wanted. Uh, I'm not sure if I want to have two copies of this even then, but the 5 5 green worm token every turn is pretty solid. Stopping our opponents from attacking with flyers as well can be quite useful. Next, we've got Spring to Mind. Spring is a 2 and a green. Search your library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield tapped. It's just basic early game ramp our turn 3 play, if we need it. The other side though is essentially a little bit more card advantage. I don't think this deck needs as much card advantage as it does, but it basically means that you're never going to run out of cards at any point during the game, so really good stuff there. Finally we got Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger, because why would you not in a ramp deck? 10 mana for a 10-10, whenever you cast him you get to exile 2 target permanents. Lands, Planeswalkers, Enchantments, Artifacts, whatever you want. He's also indestructible as well, which makes him incredibly difficult to deal with. Um, when he attacks, Defending Player exiles the top 20 cards of his or her library, so in about two turns of straight attacking, blocked or unblocked, you're going to win. Really good card. Onto the lands, we've got 7 islands and 9 forests. Uh, we pretty much want to skew in this direction, mostly because it doesn't matter because we've got plenty of jewels. But the green is very important to ramp us into the blue, so... Uh, early game, most of the stuff that we're wanting to do is green anyway, so... Uh, it's pretty much why we're skewing in that direction. That being said, we do of course have plenty of jewels. Lumbering Falls is a Simic land, but can also, for 4 mana, become a 3-3 elemental creature token with Hexproof, which means it's very hard to interact with. Control decks hate this card so if you've got Lumbering Falls it's really good for getting through your opponent's removal spells and things like that. We then have two copies of Hinterland Harbour and spell field tapped unless you control a forest on an island almost guaranteed on turn two to be untapped so two copies there. Rogue's Passage we talked about and Ether Hub. We're only three copies because we can handle the energy with our Rogue Refiners so it's essentially another dual land as well which uh, we don't always have to use the energy. So one rogue refinery, we've got three uses out of the ether hub, which is pretty great. Um, if we don't actually use the energy initially, that is anyway. But that's the deck anyway, guys. I do apologize for my coffering and uh, stirring all the way through that. Not very well, but if you wanna check out the end of the video, there is a link to the matches. I'm sure you're going to enjoy them if you did enjoy the deck tech, and if you did, like and subscribe and hit that little bell icon and all that jazz. And without further ado, I shall see you in the games guys. Bye bye.